Good morning, family. Good morning. I want to thank you guys for joining us in worship today. And listen, whether you're here in person or if you're watching us online, we really want to encourage you to stick around and listen to the message. The pastor is going to be preaching out of the Gospel of Luke on trials. So I'm sure it's going to be encouraging to all of you guys and uplifting. Um, you know, we don't have a drummer today. We do have Isaiah filling in bass. Thank you, by the way. So I, I'm saying that to say, you know, sometimes when you come in, we expect the band to be jamming and heavy praise music. It's going to be worshipful and intimate. Come on, guys. Let's, let's get ourselves together. Amen. Let's have an intimate time of worship. I want to read something to you. So listen, first of all, when we worship Jesus as worthy, what we're saying is that he is infinitely, infinitely, I'm sorry, deserving of everything that we have to offer. He's worthy of all our praise, all of our energy, and all of our attention. Amen? First Chronicles 16.25 says, For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared. Another word for feared with God is revered. Amen? Above all all other gods now God the Father through Jesus made a way for all of us in humanity five quick things then we're gonna get right to it amen first of all to know hope anybody need any hope today you don't need to raise your hand sometimes we don't want people knowing that but some he gives us hope oh that that that's enough for some people just you know you guys if I can get you guys all to stand while we get ready to go into this thing the second thing he gives us, he gives us the option of choosing him. Yeah. And remember, sadly, there's some people that won't. That's why we pray. Amen. Uh -huh. And ambassadors here for the kingdom uh -huh. of God? Amen. Yes, we are. Amen. The third one is to walk in victory in this world. In this world, to walk in victory. And number four is to know joy. Where is joy, by the way? Not just joy, but to know the joy. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is my strength. So you got strength today, folks. You got hope today. You get to choose. You chose this this morning. So we don't need to have drums and all that stuff. And by the way, pray for Dan. He's not feeling good. He had to go to urgent care. This is just family talk. Amen. Pray for our dear brother Dan. Okay. Now, even in the rough places of life, Jesus is going to be with us. But here's the most important thing I wanted to get to you. We're all standing in line. I read that somewhere online. We're all in line waiting. This is not morbid to leave this place. And as Christians, it's something very special because the fifth thing, the fifth thing that we can count on in Jesus is that we could spend all eternity with him. And if that's not enough to make you praise him, if you're lacking hope, amen, if your joy is missing, to know that one day there'll be no more days. Come on, somebody. One day, oh, hallelujah, I feel that. One day there'll be no more. You like that, Jack, huh? One day there'll be no more days. It'll be just us hanging out. And I won't be out just running on a treadmill of clouds. I'm, I tell you what, I'm going, I'm going to other planets. I'm making stuff. I'm going to have fun. I'm going to be throwing mud at my kids. It's going to be gold, so I might hurt them, maybe not. But We have a hope, guys. We have a, we have a hope. And he is so worthy of praise. You guys, just praise him right now. Just praise him. He's so worthy of all praise. Jesus, we bless you. Let's pray, church. Worthy, worthy, worthy are you, Lord. Lord, you are worthy. You are worthy. Lord, we welcome you. Holy Spirit, have your way. 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 Say that to yourself. Holy Spirit, have your way in me today. In me today, in me today. Holy Spirit, have your way. Oh, blessed be the name, God. You alone are worthy of all praise, Lord. We magnify who you are. Who you are. King of kings and Lord of lords and potentates of potentates. You are God and there's none like you. 
And we worship you because you are worthy. And as we wait in this line, we pray that you be glorified in our lives every day, sir. Let our lives be long in this world. Let them be meaningful. And as we're here, Father God, use us. Fill us. Strengthen your house today, Lord God. Strengthen those watching online, Father God. May the power of the Holy Spirit, that only power that can make a difference, touch lives today to the glory of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. My daughter years ago, she said, Dad, there's a ghost in the house. I said, baby, there's only the Holy Ghost in our house. Amen. He's worthy. Come on, church. I'm the drummer, see this? Wonder Church. Filled with wonder, awestruck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power.
about him church this is a time of worship intimate worship and I'm always reminded that he's here can you imagine that Jesus taking up space with us I don't know about you but this makes me want to just get on my knees or get underneath the concrete or something so that my Jesus would be willing to be here with me and he brings stuff he's in the atmosphere right now I don't want to sound clever, but he's actually in the air that you're breathing. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 1, this, this, yes. This is the air I breathe. Come on, church, all of us. This is the air I breathe. Your whole Living in me, living in me. My daily bread. This is my daily bread. Yes, it is. This is my daily bread. Your very This is the air I breathe, church, with all of your hearts. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Yes, Father. Your holy presence living in me. my daily bread hallelujah this is my daily bread your very word your very word spoken to me and I Anybody desperate here? Any desperate hands up? I'm desperate for you. Come on, church. Let me hear you. Let the angels of heaven hear you. And I I'm lost without you. Let's do that again. And I
band, why don't you just play for a little bit? Church. This is a moment for you. There's enough of us here. This is a moment to, to reach out to God. I'm thinking about my brother Dan right now. I'm thinking about my little sister Ava right now. I'm desperate for the Lord to meet them where they are right now. Take this as an opportunity as you're worshiping him, knowing that he's going to meet you. He's going to meet your humanity with his spirit. Please don't leave here without reaching in. Thinking about my son and my daughter. How many of you guys heard about the firemen that fire truck turned over on the freeway? That was my son's friends. He was in the hospital. There's stuff going on there. I'm desperate for God to protect these men and women, to protect the law enforcement, to protect us, to protect our children. Father, we're desperate for you. We have faith, Lord God, but help us in our unbelief. making a declaration that's true. I'm desperate for you. Thank you. And I'm found by you. Amen. Oh, we're found by you. Oh, we're found by you. Oh, thank you, Lord God. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their seed begging bread. <laughs> Hallelujah. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Amen. All the plans that he has for you are good. They're not bad. They're plans to prosper you and not to harm you. They're plans to bring you to a good end. Hallelujah. But you got to reach them and street, reach out and be desperate for them. You got to be honest when you're feeling lost without him. I'm lost without you. Yes, Lord. Oh, and I'm desperate for you. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Oh, Holy Spirit. Yes. Oh, I sense the presence of the Holy Spirit. Oh, let's indulge that church. Oh, Holy Spirit. And I've heard it said, some people think, well, you know, there's God the Father, and then there's, of course, Jesus, and then there's the Holy Spirit. No. They're all one, God. The power and the authority that raised Jesus from the dead, the Holy Spirit, dwells in your mortal bodies. Can we practice for Jesus coming to get us in the next couple seconds? Can we practice what it's going to look like when we see his face? Can we practice that right now? Because he's going to come. He's coming back for you, church. If you're watching online and you're without hope, there's hope and he's coming back for you. Jesus. Hallelujah.
Show me your face, Lord. Show me your face. And gird up my legs that I might stand in this holy place. Hallelujah, Jesus. Show me your face, Lord. And your power and your grace. All oh, his here, church. I will make it to the end <laughs> if I can just see your face. Let's keep going with this. Show me your face, Lord. Show me your face. I might stand in this holy place. This is holy ground, I promise you, church. And show me your face, Lord. Your power and your grace. I'm going to make it. I can make it to the end. If I can just see your face, that last line, I can make it to the end. If I can just see your face. That's us.
blessing you, Jesus. Yes. So worthy. Come on, church. Day and night. Two times. Day and night. Night and day. Let incense arise. Day and night. Night and day. Let incense arise. Day and night. Night and day. Let incense arise. Day and night. Night and day. To rise, build it up a little bit. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Oh, yes, Lord. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. You of it all. Yes, you are, Jesus. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. One more time. You are worthy of it all. All the voices in the church, everybody singing. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. You deserve the glory. You deserve all the glory, Lord. You deserve all the glory. You're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy. Church in the Bible, Revelation 4, gives us a picture of the throne room of heaven. And this is what we should understand as we worship God by the Spirit. This is the access that we have with the living God. And it says immediately, John says, I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. And around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes. And they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Because the Holy Spirit is perfect, seven represents perfection. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures, full of eyes in front and in back. And the first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. If we see in the word of God the description not only are the angels worshiping God, not only are these magnificent creatures, these four living creatures that even the description seems hard to comprehend, and yet we see that the 24 elders also 
Now, these are men of high regard. I believe they represent the 12 elders from the Old Testament and the 12 apostles of the New Testament. These are going to be the greatest of everybody in heaven. There's going to be no one except for God, except from the Lord. Understand, Michael the archangel, all the archangels are not going to be as great as the 24 elders. Because Jesus said, he told the disciples, you are going to sit on thrones with me. Why I point this out is because if they, if they left their thrones and they laid before the Lord, they cast their, th their crowns before the Lord, declaring that Jesus is Lord, declaring that God the Father is Lord, the Father and the Son are one. Even though Jesus is at the right hand of the throne, they're one. And so they cast their crowns before the Lord. How much more for you and me? How much more for you and me should we give allegiance to the living God from our hearts? Should there be nothing that gets in the way of our worship to the Lord? There shouldn't be anything that gets in the way that we say, well, I, God, I can't do that because of this reason. No, there should be nothing that gets in the way that we should in our hearts, in our minds, with our voices, with our actions, say, Lord, you're worthy of it all. You're worthy. There's no place, Lord, that you can't have. There's no place that I don't surrender to you. There's no place, Lord God, that I hold back for myself because you're worthy, because you're God, because you're so good to us. You're so good. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. The Lord's good to you, church. He is good to you. He is continually good. He will always be good. He will never stop being good. No matter what we face, the Lord is good. The Lord is at work. Even when you think you don't see God, even when you think nothing is happening, the Lord is at work more than you realize. The Lord's heard your prayers. He's heard your requests. He's faithful. He will answer. He gets the last word. Do not give up. Do not grow weary in well-doing. Trust your God who is good, your Father in heaven, your Savior, Jesus, your great high priest. He hears your request. The Lord is bringing his answer. It is coming to you. It is coming to you, says the Lord. It is coming to you. Do not grow weary. Do not grow weary while waiting. Do not grow weary in the waiting, says the Lord. But know that the Lord says, my answer is coming to you. And when you receive it, it will be speedily. When you receive it, when it comes to fruition, you will say the Lord indeed is good and he has always shown himself faithful. And he will continue to show himself faithful. Lord, thank you that you are worthy. Thank you for your goodness. Lord, you are eternal. Lord, you are eternal. Lord, this life is but a vapor. Lord, this life is but a vapor. We are but a vapor in this life, in this earth, in the context of time. But Lord, you, you're eternal. And it's because of you, Lord Jesus, that we share in your glory. So God, we thank you, even in this moment, even for those who need hope, even for those who are waiting, waiting, waiting upon you, waiting upon the answer, waiting upon the, the request that they have made, that they have said, Lord, you said that if I ask, I will Receive. If I seek, I will find. If I knock, the door will be open. The Lord is speaking to you. The Lord is declaring to you his faithfulness. He's saying to you, my child, I have heard your request, and I am bringing the answer. The answer is coming. I have not forgotten you. I have not forsaken you. The Lord says, hold on and trust me that I am good, and that in my power... And that in my perfect plan, my perfect will, I am bringing about justice. I am bringing about my will. I'm bringing about my good.
and you will see it with your eyes, says the Lord. You will see it, you will taste it, and you will declare how good the Lord is. Brother Bill, would you come on up and lead us in communion here this morning? morning. In John, the Lord says, my word is life to those who believe. Understand that. The very words that he speaks, he has written, and we repeat or we read or we hear brings life to those who believe. I say that because we're entering into communion. And last time I spoke on communion, I spoke on the elements, the bread, the cup, that they were more than just a cup and a piece of bread. But even more so are the words that are spoken. They bring life to those who believe to those who receive. Communion is a practice that the whole church observes in remembering the sacrifice that Christ made for us. The doctrine of communion or teaching was given to us by Jesus. And he commanded us to remember it and to do it often. In doing so, we remember Jesus calling himself the bread of life, which means that he nourishes us. We survive because of him. He, satisfi he satisfies us when everything else leaves us empty. John 6, 48. In John 6, 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. In the book, Foundation for a Christian Doctrine by Kevin Connor, that by the way, I'll put a plug in. We, we meet Mondays at 6 o'clock. This is the second time I've gone through this book with Pastor Gabe. There's always something there. If you want to feel strength in your walk, you want to feel, have the, the, just the confidence in your walk when somebody comes up, why do you believe? These classes are the word of God. They will bring life to your walk. They will bring life to somebody else that you might love and care for. So I encourage you to come. But even then, going through the second time, he stated, all doctrine remains only a lifeless theory until it is put into practice. What does that mean? It shocked me. If we're just doing a thing religiously, just to do it, 
That's just a theory. That's just nothing. But if we do it because we believe, we do it because he commands us to do it because it so pleases God to hear his words come back to him. It brings life to us. It brings strength to us. So as we take communion today, we must ask ourselves, are we taking or partaking of a lifeless theory? Or are we aligning ourselves up with the promises of communion? Let us remember that communion is not an obligation, but a celebration. We celebrate a better covenant and a better relationship with the Father because of his son going to the cross for us. So take the bread. Jesus, as we take this bread that represents your body that was sacrificed for our sins, let us remember and we believe that you are the bread of life and whoever believes in you will have everlasting spiritual life. Break the bread and take. Take the cup. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-five, verse 26, in the Passion Translation, it states this. Jesus did the same with the cup of wine after supper and said, this cup seals the new covenant with my blood. Drink it, and whenever you drink this, do it in remembrance of me. Whenever you eat this bread, drink this cup, you are retelling the story, proclaiming our Lord's death until he comes. Take the cup. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for this celebration in communion today. And remember and the reminder of your victory on the cross. You are my bread of life. I shall never hunger and I shall never thirst. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor. Thank you. Wonderful. Praise God. Lord is so good to us. Would you turn and greet somebody and tell them you're glad they're in God's house here today?
Well, good morning again. God bless you all. You know, before we move on here, I wanted to, Sister Pam Johnson had something that I wanted to, everyone to hear uh, that she's going to share with us here. So uh, Bill was talking about how, um, you know, it, it being versus theory versus practice. And, you know, this week uh, I came down with a really bad sore throat. So this side of me, you know, just started swelling up. My throat was really sore. And I started to panic because my doctor just retired. I, I don't have a new doctor yet. And I knew I couldn't get in. And with my past, I know that it goes immediately into things that take me into pneumonia. So I kind of panicked. And then I heard the Lord say, what about your covenant? I went, oh, right, my covenant. And... I started praying, and I, and I heard myself begin to make declarations. It was, it's in me. It's in us, but we forget it's there. We forget the word that we know, but it's, it's in us. But Holy Spirit will bring it back and remind us. And I started making declarations, and I said, you know what? The blood of Jesus is against you. You have to go. Any virus, any bacteria that's in there, you've got to just leave my body. You have no right to it because I have covenant with the, with the Lord Most High. And you must leave in Jesus' name. And I went, wow, that was good. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. And then it got worse. And so I said, okay. Still the same. I have covenant with God. My throat is getting better. I don't care what I feel like. I don't care what it looks like. And then, of course, this was getting worse. It's getting even more tender. And then I just kept saying, Lord, I have a covenant with you. And all of a sudden, it's like it connected. You know, you begin to speak the word of God, and there's life in it. And this is a practical application of what God is telling us. We just have to get into it. We have to fight. We can't just lay back and think the devil's just going to run off. He's not. You've got to evict him with the word of God. You're not doing the evicting, but the word in us, the life in us, who Jesus is, what, they, what he's prepared for us and given us, and we believe it, we begin to speak it, we begin to see things happen. And so I want to tell you, I walked this morning, my throat is fine. This is just a tent, little bit tender, but there's no swelling. And I'm going, thank you, Lord. Thank you. And then, and you know, and after you pray, I don't, I tend to do more thanking him that it's done. Because I've already made the declaration. I've already uh, told the enemy he has to get out. And now I thank God for what he said and the covenant I have with him. So. Thank you, Pam. Wonderful. Yes, he is. He's faithful, faithful God. And, you know, and, and I want you to really take note of what Pam was sharing there about laying hold of the word of God for every situation that, that you face. We really have to communicate, declare God's word, de declare God's word over us. Understand what, you know, the promises of God are, they're for us, and they're yes, and they're amen, meaning they're good for you. They're, they're, it's good. God's promises, God's, his covenant, it's a promise to us. This is what we are a part of. This is just what we were partaking of in communion. It's a reminder, especially when we drink the cup it's a reminder that we are part of the new covenant. He says, this is the new covenant in my blood. So when you're declaring that you're part of the, the promises of God for your life, that this is why Isaiah says that by his stripes we are healed. This is part of the promise and that we need to lay hold of that in faith. And declare it. And I love the fact that Pam was saying it didn't take place, you know, right instantly. It didn't happen even the next day. In fact, it, she still was dealing with it. But as she's continued to stay in it in faith, she's seeing God touch her body. You know, and, and this is for us, you know, Romans 8, 11. If the same Holy Spirit who raised Christ Jesus from the dead 
lives in you, meaning, yes, he does live in us. You're a believer. You believe in Jesus. The Holy Spirit is alive in you. And Paul goes on. The Apostle Paul says that, that the same Holy Spirit will bring life to your mortal body. He'll bring life, living power, healing, whatever we need. If we need hope, he'll bring hope. If we're in fear, he'll bring strength. If we need healing, he'll bring healing. If we're in depression, he'll bring life. This is what he does. This is why Jesus says that he came to give us life and life more abundantly. Sister Pam, God bless you. Thank you for sharing that encouragement. It's beautiful, beautiful. I, I believe that we need to hear that and take that in. And so thank you for sharing that and, and not letting it go. You could have just let it go. But I appreciate your boldness and, and uh, your faith and that that's stated because that's life for us. Amen? Amen. Praise God. All right. Well, just before we get into the word of God here, just a, a couple of announcements. So tomorrow, uh, tomorrow night at six o'clock, we have our foundations class. And so we invite you to come on out. Uh, we, we started our first class last Monday uh, it is really good. You, you heard uh, Bill Johnson's wonderful advertisement for that. I couldn't have done a better job. So thank you, Brother Bill. Uh, but, but it is really good. And so we encourage you to come on out. Uh, we'll be going uh, through the class until about the end of October. Um, and uh, I believe that you will be greatly encouraged in the Lord and in the word of God. Uh, the word of God becoming more and more alive to you. And that we all need that. Jesus says, mankind does not live by bread alone, but we do live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And that, that important word there is live. We get life from the word of God. And, and sometimes it takes a little time to invest into the word of God to really see the benefits of life, but we all need to do it. It, 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 it is alive. The word of God is alive and, and brings life to us. Jesus is called the word of God. He's the logos but, the, but also we see there's the rhema, the spoken word of God that we need to hear. And all of these combined uh, is life for us. And so we encourage you, come on out. Thursday morning Bible studies, speaking of the word of God, uh, we study each week what, we, what is heard on Sunday morning. We go into uh, Thursday mornings at 10. So we invite you to come on out and join us. And then, of course, um, we're here every Sunday. So God bless you all. And uh, did I miss anything? All right. Wonderful. Uh, just a reminder, how do we give in the house of God? You know, uh, it's one of those things of where uh, we understand that there's, there's need. None, nothing is free in life. And, and we're blessed that we can gather together as God's people. Uh, we're blessed in uh, that we have a place that we uh, meet with God. This is, this is our Bethel. You know, this is our house of God for us. And, and it's never spe it doesn't have to be specific to just one location. But for us in this season, this is our our place where we meet. But there are costs involved. Uh, there are things that are necessary. And so I have to ask uh, for your generosity. I have to ask and remind um, that you give to the house of God and for the things of God. And so this is why we do this each week, not to belabor it or, or anything like that. But. It's just a reminder. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says this. Remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. So the word of God gives us a, a, this comparison. When it comes to giving, it's like a farmer sowing seed. And this is a principle of the kingdom of God. It's not wasted. When you give, it's not wasted. It, it, it's seed that is sown. And it's not, you know, we can get this idea, well, I give it to the church and there you go and I'll never see it again. That, that's not what the Bible teaches us. The Bible is showing to us that when you sow, there's greater reward than just what you gave, than just the, the tax credit, okay? There's greater reward in that and it, it's, it's multiplied back. You know, if you've ever planted anything, and if you haven't, I encourage you, plant something so you'll get to see this uh, uh, process come to pass. You know, and, and I, I love Bill Leal uh, the other, other day shared about how, you know, he bought these cheap seeds. And he got nothing from the cheap seeds. And so then he said, you know what, I'm going to buy the, the little more expensive seeds. I'm going to pay a little bit more. I'm going to invest a little bit more uh, in, in better seeds to see a better yield. And, you know, and that's what the word of God is saying to us here in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 is, you know, the, the idea that it's not just, well, I'm just throwing this away and it's a loss. No, it's not. 
It's a blessing that's going to come back to you, but it's going to come back to you in many different ways. It might come back to you financially. There's, there's nothing that stops that or hinders that. God is good. He provides. He takes care of. And, I, and I've seen that. I know God does that. But also, he's going to respond in, in several other ways. You know, we, we know that the Bible shows us, you know, that we might, this might get weird for us, but we know that Cornelius, in the book of Acts, why did God tell Peter to go to Cornelius? Because it was in response to his giving. Now, for some of us, you might hear that and go, oh, no, 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 no. It can't be just measured just based upon giving. But that's what the book of Acts in chapter 10 tells us, that it came up, his giving came up as a memorial before God. So what does that say about in our giving and in our generosity? It's, it's not about the money. It's never about the money. It's about what's going on inside of our hearts where we say, Lord, I trust you, but I also put your word. I believe your word. Just as Pam was talking about trusting that his promises, what he has promised to us. Covenant is promise. And what he has promised unto us, we hold on to that. It's the word of God. It's the same in giving as we sow, believing him. Not, not sowing because we feel forced to. Not sowing because of anything else. But, Lord, we believe you. We believe your word and we believe your promise. And in obedience to faith and obedience to what you have said, we sow and we believe for the return. And, and this is what we do. Amen. Does that make sense? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for the promise of your word. Thank you, Lord God, that it's you, that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights, with whom there is no shadow and there's no variation of turning, Lord God. Lord, you indeed bring good to us. And so, Lord, I ask that you bless each one here. And, Lord God, I ask that you bless the sower and increase, Lord God, as they sow in faith, trusting your word. And, Lord, thank you that you provide for this house. Not only do you provide for your people, but you provide for the church. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we are, uh, we're almost done in the book of Luke. We are uh, here looking at the trial. The, the trial of faith is what we're seeing here, but the trial that Jesus went through. You know, you might say, Jesus went through a trial? I thought only we go through trials. No, Jesus went through trials. Bless the children. Bless Sharon and bless the children this morning, Children's Church. Yeah, and we'll <laughs> welcome back to the Simons. In Jesus' name. So Jesus also went through trial and went through a trial. You know, you might say, I'm in this trial, Lord, and I just wish you would deliver me, and I wish you, wish you would work it out, and, and why aren't you responding? Well, we need to go and look at what Luke 22 describes about Jesus going through the trial himself, and it was a very unfair trial. You ever been through a situation where you feel like, this is unfair, God? This is really unfair, and why am I going through this? The Lord also went through a trial that was uh, set up against him. And sometimes we might feel like this is so unfair, but understand that the Lord also went through something very unfair. And we see the goodness of God for us. We see the example of how we're to go through those things if we can hear and if we can have a heart to, to receive here. And so let's pray and let's ask uh, God that our hearts would be open to him to be able to receive the truth of his word. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that we live by your word. Thank you, Lord God, that you have sent your word to us and it's been delivered for us that we might receive it, that it might be planted in us, that it might be good ground, that we might hide it and keep it inside our hearts, Lord God, that we would not sin against you, that we would not be disobedient or align ourselves against you. Holy Spirit, you're the teacher. You are the one that helps us to remember the words of our Lord. And so, God, we come before you and we commit our hearts openly now. Lord God, let us not be distracted. Let us not be carried away by thoughts or cares or worries. But, Lord, that we come in this time to focus upon you and upon what your word teaches us, that we would be good ground, that we would bear much fruit for you, Father, and that you would be glorified by this. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen. All right, so it says here, Luke 22, verse, starting in verse 66, if you have your Bible open and if you're following along and if you're taking notes, it says, as soon as it was day, 
the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, came together and led him into their council, saying, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will by no means believe. And if I also ask you, you will by no means answer me or let me go. Hereafter, the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. And then they all said, Are you then the Son of God? And so he said to them, You rightly say that I am. And they said, What further testimony do we need? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. Amen. That's the word of God. Now, understand, as I've been mentioning, each of us will face trials of faith in this life. You might be going through one right now. You might be in a situation where, Lord, this is truly a trial of faith that I'm going through because I'm feeling tempted to not believe you. I'm feeling tempted to not believe your word and your promise. And so, Lord, I stand on your word. What do we do when we're tempted in that regard? We must stand on the word of God. Anytime you're tempted, you must go to the word of God. You flee whatever is trying to pull you down and you you run to the word of God. You run to the Lord. You ask the Holy Spirit to help you and empower you and strengthen you. First Peter 1 7 says this. That the genuineness of your faith. What does that mean? The genuineness of your faith. It's a, a real faith. It's sincere faith. It's following Christ. That, that doesn't mean perfect, but that means real. You know, the Bible tells us in Proverbs, it says the righteous fall seven times, but they get up. You know, it's one thing to stumble and stay there on the ground. I'd get on the ground, but I don't want to do that right now. But, but you, you get the point. You know, it's one thing to stumble and fall and just lay there and, and, and pity yourself Oh, I can't do this. I can't live this way. And oh, just give up on me, God. I'm worthless. No, that's not what the righteous person does. The Bible says that the righteous person gets up. He may fall seven times, but he gets up. What does that mean? That means you just keep persevering. Because what's going to happen is eventually you keep getting up and it's going to stick. The, 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 the understanding, the enlightenment of God by his word, you keep pressing into the word of God. It's going to lay hold on your life because it is indeed alive. It's not one of those things. Oh, I tried it once or twice or three times and it just didn't work for me. What are you doing? That's not real. You're, 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 you're rubbing a genie's bottle. You may as well be asking Santa Claus and being on the good list and not the naughty list. There's no faith in that. This is real. It's genuine. And so Peter's saying the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes. It's much more important to God, though it is tested by fire. The trials. OK, when you're going through trials, you feel like you're in the fire. You know, there's a lot of pressure going on in your life. That's the fire. That's the trials of fire. It's not to be you know, you're not to think that am I the only one going through this? No, everyone goes through this. This is a part of the Christian walk. This is what you're going to face following Jesus. You, you know, I was talking about this on, on uh, Thursday, the Bible study. If you're as a parent, if you're a parent here, you, you, you can relate to this. If you say as a parent, you have a, a, a young child, let's say a toddler. And they're growing up in that age. And, you know, you just as a parent, you love your children, of course, and you want them to have good things. Jesus says, you being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. You know, if he asks for uh, an egg, we give him a snake. You know, if he asks for, I don't know, is it bread? We give him a scorpion, right? And all, all that. You know, you're not going to give your child bad. But understand, if you were to give your child everything that they wanted, you would destroy them. You might be thinking, oh, but I want good for them. I'm never going to tell them no. And you're always going to tell them yes. You're going to raise a spoiled child. You're going to destroy them. Because they're never going to learn what it is, the, the trials of life. No is a good thing sometimes. Now, I'm not saying, you know, if you're asking for normal things, you know, can we have some clothes? Can we get some new shoes? And all? Yeah, you need that. Yes, absolutely. But if they're going, oh, can I have this, you know, most expensive thing ever and always and yes, and okay, now tomorrow I want this and that's old and I want that. No, you're going to destroy them. 
because they're going to have a wrong perspective of what life is truly like. Well, understand the same way. You know, you're going to be tested by fire in this life because that's proving. You know, when, when gold is tested in the fire, it becomes, it becomes stronger or it becomes more durable. It becomes pure. The purity of gold comes through the fire. Precious stones, when they're put in the test of the fire, they become more durable. They become stronger. And this is the same thing Peter is describing about our, our faith, our faith, our belief in God, our belief upon what the word of God says. This is precious. It's precious to God, and it's more precious than gold that perishes. In other words, the Bible is trying to give us something so valuable that people will stop immediately when they see it. You know, if you find a piece of gold on the ground, you're going to pick that up because it's valuable. Well, the Word of God is saying your faith is so much more valuable than gold that's going to perish one day. You're going to stand before God. It's not going to be gold that you're going to be able to offer. It's going to be your faith. Did you believe? Did you believe in in my son? Did you believe that my son is the only way to righteousness? Did you believe that Jesus dying on the cross for your sins and you believing him and repenting and following Jesus, that that's what's going to be most important when it comes to eternal life? This is what the Lord is looking for. And so the Bible goes on. It says, though it's tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what God is looking for when this is all said and done. That your faith will be found to praise, to honor, and to glory the living God when Jesus Christ himself is revealed. That's what's most important, church. That's what's going to matter. That's what's going to matter. It's not going to be about how successful you were in this life. It's not going to be about all the achievements that you achieved in this life. What's going to matter is when the Lord Jesus returns, he's going to be looking for your faith. And he's going to be looking for a faith even though it was tested by fire, even though you went through difficult things in life. He's not going to be he's not going to say, "Oh, those difficult things, those things made you sad and made you give up and I understand." No, that's not what he's going to do because Jesus went through difficult things for me and you. He didn't go through those things for himself. He went through those things for me and you. And what he's looking for is he's looking for a faith that's going to be found to praise the living God. He's going to be looking for a faith that honors the living God. He's going to be looking for a faith that glorifies the living God when Jesus Christ is revealed. Not fearful, not, oh, I don't know if I'm ready. None of those things. He's looking for you to have faith to believe. It's not about being perfect, church. It's not about your own moral goodness. When you live for the Lord, that's going to be the response that comes out of your life because you desire to please him. But that's not the aim. It's not looking about, well, do I look good on the outside? Is everything good? Is that, is it? That's what the Pharisees did. They were whitewashed tombs. They looked good on the outside, but inside they were death. See, the Lord is looking for your faith. Do you believe? It doesn't matter what you're struggling with right now. It doesn't matter the, the, the trial that you're going through. Do you believe the living God? Do you believe that the Father has sent his Son, that whoever would believe in him, whosoever would believe in him, would not perish but have everlasting life? And that should affect everything that we do in our life. That sh- should affect how we speak how we act, how we treat others based on what the living God has declared to us, his word. Can you say amen to that, church? So as Christ's return, when Christ returns, the Lord is going to be looking for us to have this sincere, genuine faith. That's what he's looking for, a sincere faith, not a fake faith, not just, oh, yeah, amen, yeah, yeah, but you don't live it, you don't believe it inside of you. When you don't live it, it means you don't believe it. That's really what it boils down to. But if you believe it, you're going to live it. You know, when when I'm following Jesus, you know, Paul says, follow me as I follow Jesus. So what we're doing is we're following Jesus. So there's some cables right here, but I'm sincerely following Jesus. But let's say that as I'm doing that, I get my foot caught in this cable and I trip up and I fall. I'm still following Jesus, but now I've, I've fallen on the ground. So the righteous person what do they do if they're following Jesus because Jesus is still moving he's still going forward I get back up sorry you can't see me on camera but just here but I get back up see that's what following Christ looks like 
sometimes we get in this perspective of, oh, I've blown it now. Oh, and I'm so ashamed. I'm so embarrassed. And, oh, you know, especially if it was a public thing. And so now I can't face the people in church. All those are lies of the enemy. The lies of the enemy. Oh, you can't go to church anymore because, oh, no, no, they're going to laugh at you. And they're, oh, who do you think you are that you can go to church and raise your hands to Jesus? Look what you did. You fell. That's not what God says. He's saying to you each time, do you believe? Do you believe? Yes, I do. Well, get up. Come on, son. Get up. Come on, daughter. Get up. You believe, right? Get up. He, the, the, the promises are still there. The covenant's still there. Oh, I don't know. Did everybody hear that? The covenant is still there, church. The promise is still there. God didn't give up on you. You get back up. That's sincere faith. That's sincere faith. You know, we, we think that it means, oh, I'm going to live so perfectly. You know, he does give us life, but understand, you're going to go through trials. Sometimes your trial may be your own failings. And he's saying, will you believe me even in the midst of this? Even in this trial that you're facing? Even in your own weakness, will you still believe me that my word is true? Even though your own heart is trying to deceive you. Even when your own heart is trying to tell you, just give up. You can't do this. You can't live this way. Who do you think you are? So that's, some, that's why sometimes you have to just say, oh, heart, wicked, wicked heart. Who can know it? But Lord, thank you because your promise to me is all I have to do is just believe the promise. That's it. Just believe. And the, the Lord works on us and he brings about the change. But we 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 as we get into the word of God more and more, that's where life comes from. That's where faith rises in our hearts. Make sense. The Lord faithfully endured a mockery of a trial before he was crucified. The religious leaders wanted him killed and they were going to make it happen, even if it went against the very law of God. What, maybe you're, what 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 do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? You know, they they also broke God's commandments when they took the Lord to trial. They, they also broke the very law of God that they claimed was their basis of, of their so-called belief. Yet we should not miss what the Lord Jesus says here in response to their to the accusations of the the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin would basically be the equivalent of their Supreme Court. Remember that uh Jewish tradition, uh, the, the religious leaders, all of that is was based upon what we have today. Our, our modern law is based upon the Mosaic law. So everything was structured as far as the leadership, like like what we would consider law. But everything that they had was based from the word of God. And so the Sanhedrin, this was basically their Supreme Court. It was a Jewish Supreme Council of Judges. And so this is what they've gathered together. Now it's now it's morning time or, or daylight and they're all gathered together. In Luke twenty two sixty seven, 67, Jesus says, if I tell you, this is what he said to them, if I tell you, you will by no means believe. They had no faith. They did not believe. How do we know they did not believe? Jesus says that they did not believe. We, only, we know that only Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, as far as the Gospels are concerned, there's, there's priests that turn to the Lord in the book of Acts, but as far as this moment in the Gospels, we know that only Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea were the only two priests uh, from, from the uh, Jewish leadership that believed in Jesus. But he's, they're not in this moment, and he's saying to them, you do not believe. You will by no means believe. According to God's word, what we believe is integral to our faith and our relationship with God. If, if we're in weakness of faith, if we're in weakness of what we believe, we, that we need to let the word of God begin to speak to our hearts and minds. We need to go to the word of God and get our information from God's word. You know, too many times we let we get information from other sources and that begins to hinder our faith. And we can't do that. And we need to be aware that that's what's happening. Whenever our faith is hindered, stop yourself and say, where am I getting my information? Where am I getting these thoughts from? What am I pulling that from? Why do I think that that something that is hindering my faith, why do I think that that is the truth as opposed to the word of God? Now, I know there's many times 
part of it is on us because we need to go study out the word of God more. We need to know God. We need to increase in knowing God. There's going to be times where as we study the word of God, you're going to read that and you say, I didn't know that the Bible said that. I didn't know that the Bible ever said that. That because we need to grow in the word of God. And I tell you, you're going to read the word of God. You can have read the entirety of God's word many, many times, and you're still going to find new things in the Bible. And the the scriptures are going to say, Lord, I never saw it that way before. Thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for revealing that. And so, but when we are lacking in faith, when we're struggling in belief, the one thing that we also are going to see marked in our life is there's a lack of the word of God going on inside of us. We're not feeding our soul. We're not feeding our spirit. And so and this is what's happening that they're there. These men do not believe our basis of belief in Christ must come from a reliance on God's word cannot be based on anything else or our faith will eventually become corrupt and could leave us with a shipwrecked or destroyed faith. What do I mean by shipwrecked or destroyed faith? The Apostle Paul spoke about this in First Timothy chapter one. 18 through 19. And he says this, this charge or this command I commit to you, son Timothy, Paul and Timothy, Paul and Timothy had this strong relationship. He refers to Timothy and Titus uh, in the Bible as his sons. They, They were not blood, but this is the kind of relationship that they had. He was a father to them and he considered them his sons. They considered him their father. So he says, my son, Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected concerning their faith, have suffered shipwreck. So he talks about shipwreck faiths because they have become corrupted. They've allowed other things to replace the truth in their lives. If we allow other things to replace the truth of God's word in our lives, what's going to happen is we become corrupt. We become corrupted, and it becomes difficult for us to receive by faith. And if we continue to allow that, if we don't come to repentance before the Lord, if we don't cast down those strongholds and that vain imagination, if we don't cast it down and and call it false and declare the truth of God's word over our hearts and minds, the Bible tells us that we will become corrupted. And if we allow that to continue, the Bible says that we will become shipwrecked in our faith. You know, when a ship wrecks like that, there's nothing you can do but completely take it apart. And that's something that we should be careful about. But I also want you to see there in 1 Timothy, notice what he says there in verse 18. He says, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you. And I want you to understand, there's a, I don't want to rabbit trail us here, but just, just for a quick moment, brief moment here, understand the importance of prophetic words in our lives. Look at what the Apostle Paul says about the prophetic words, about the prophetic. He says that by them, what is he talking about? By the prophetic words we receive, that by them you may wage the good warfare. That by when you receive that prophetic word that you hold on in faith and that you can wage good warfare in your spiritual battles. Because what's going to happen when you receive a prophetic word? Oh, that wasn't true. It didn't come to pass. It's not going to happen. Doubt comes in. Oh, that, that, no, that wasn't. God doesn't do that. You know, be careful of that. Be careful when you hear these so-called teachers of the word of God and they tell you, oh, prophetic words, are that, that's all done. That's all done away with. That, that was in a past age, the age of the apostles. That's all done. What do you think Paul is talking about here? He's talking to Timothy about the prophetic words, prophecies, previously made concerning you. He's not talking about the the prophetic words of the Old Testament about the the Lord, about the Messiah. He's talking about prophetic words specifically spoken to Timothy so that Timothy can use them and to wage the good warfare, to wage the fight. We're always in a fight, church. You're always in a spiritual battle. If you think that you're not in a spiritual battle or if you're ever tired of being in a spiritual battle, you got it all wrong. You misunderstand the life as a Christian and what it's all about. The demonic realm does not care if you're tired. 
The demonic realm doesn't care if you're on an off day. The demonic realm cheats and fights unfairly, and they're wicked. Because they're wicked, they're evil. But we have a mighty God. Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. The Spirit of God is in you, and he is power. And he gives you life even when you feel the bombardment of the enemy. And he brings life, and he brings peace to chaos. Even when you're in a moment of chaos and you feel frustrated, you can call out to the living God, and he is faithful to deliver you. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of every single one. So we need those prophetic words. Don't resist that. Don't resist those things. This is why. This goes back to why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, he says, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. Be zealous for spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy so that you can bring that prophetic encouragement to somebody else. Oh, you're not hearing me, are you? If we deliberately violate our own conscience by believing something else or adding to our faith what God's word does not support, we will become corrupted, church. Hear me, hear me. Understand there's a reason why the the church of Laodicea is recorded in the book of Revelation. There's a reason why God talks about that the church in the last days will become indifferent because the word of God will no longer be important to us. It'll be about hearing things that make us feel good. It'll be about hearing, you know, the, the preacher that just preaches he's just a comedian. Just telling jokes the whole time. People are laughing and feeling great, but not necessarily the word of God being taught. Now, you might you could have somebody anointed and, and you know, make you laugh, but it's, it's still the word of God. Praise God. But what I'm saying is we're preachers because they don't know what else to do. They're just trying to just fill seats. Just trying to bring money in. Not, they're not concerned about the things of the kingdom of God. And they're just looking for ways to keep people coming in because because church is a revolving door. That's true. It is. It shouldn't be. It should not be. We should be family. We should understand that we're here and we're family in this. And and we're walking this walk together. That's what the word of God teaches. That's how church is supposed to be. But understand what happens is when we're trying to trust in something other than the living God and believe something other than the living God. We this is where we can deliberately violate our conscience and believe something else or trying to add to our faith what God's word doesn't support. So here specifically, we're reading how the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders and the governing body of of leaders under the high priest did not believe that Jesus was the Christ. They didn't believe that he was the Lord's anointed one. And in fact, they accused him of becoming of being a blasphemer and subject to the penalty of death. Ultimately, they knew the people believed the the outside, the the crowds. They knew that the people of Jerusalem and and those throughout the lands in Israel they believed. They saw him do the, these, all these miracles. They saw their lives changed. You know, we know that because of Lazarus, many were believing in the Lord. And that's why the high priests and the religious leaders, they wanted to kill Lazarus as well, the Bible says. But ultimately, they knew that, that the people outside believed and many were beginning to follow him. Yet the religious leaders did not. Luke 22, 2 says, And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. They feared the people. They didn't fear God. They didn't fear the Lord or have reverence for him. They, fe- they were afraid of the people. They knew that if all the people started following Jesus and believing him to be the Messiah, they would lose all of their political power. They would lose their power, their authority, their position with Rome. And this trial was not out of a sense or, or a desire to please God. They, they didn't, it wasn't inside them, oh, well, we got to honor God, and so this man's a blasphemer, and, and he says he's the Messiah, he's not. That's not what they were doing. It wasn't out of ignorance. They were afraid of losing their political power. This wasn't like Saul of Tarsus, so what Saul did, he did out of ignorance, and he came to repentance once the Lord revealed himself to him. No, these religious leaders, they were, had all become corrupted. John eleven forty seven 47 through 52, it says this. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man, 
works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and not that the whole nation should perish. Now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Now, this was really their motive, to have Jesus killed, to save their own positions of power. Yet we see how God uses their corruption and their hardness of heart still, even though this is how they were, but he's going to bring about his plan of salvation. Even in that, even this is the amazing thing about God. God was able to use, even though they were completely corrupt, he was able to use that for the purposes of his plan of salvation. Now, interestingly, even though the Old Testament prophecies confirmed and found their fulfillment in Jesus Christ, yet these uh, law experts, these experts of the law, were so corrupt and hardened heart that they could not see the Lord. They couldn't see him as the Lord based upon what the, the very law, the very uh, uh, um, testament that they held to and that they believed they represented. When the Sanhedrin asked Jesus if he is the Christ, they asked not because they believed, but because they sought a reason to kill Jesus. And Jesus answers the Pharisees, I am and you will see me at the right hand of the power. What does that mean? Let's look here. Matthew 26, 59 through 61. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. They didn't find anybody who was truthful who had a testimony of Jesus doing wrong. And so then it says, even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at the last, two false witnesses came forward and they said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. So what do they do? The Sanhedrin, they look for false witnesses because they can't find anybody true. They can't find anything of the truth that would... Uh, show Jesus uh, to be uh, blasphemous. So the Sanhedrin, they, they get these false witnesses, but this also was prophesied in the book of Psalms 27, 12. It says, do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have riv risen against me and such as breathe out violence. So the Lord already declared this was going to happen. Jesus knows this is going to happen. Even the law says you cannot put a person to death without the testimony of two or three witnesses. Let me, let me re, uh, show this to you. Let's look in, in uh, the Old Testament. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 5.20 says, You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. So first of all, the commands of God's law already say you cannot lie about your neighbor. You can't bear false witness for them or, or about them. You must speak the truth. Deuteronomy 17, 2 through 6, it says, If there is found among you within any of your gates or any of your towns which the Lord your God gives you, a man or a woman who has been wicked in the sight of the Lord your God in transgressing his covenant, who has gone and served other gods and worshipped them, either the sun or moon or any of the hosts of heaven which I have not commanded, and it is told you, and you hear of it, then you shall inquire diligently. And if it is indeed true and certain that such an abomination has been committed in Israel, then you shall bring out to your gates that man or woman who has committed that wicked thing. You know, isn't it interesting, you know, when we, we can judge people just based upon what one person says. You know, we can judge people because one person says something. But the Bible tells us you, you never judge somebody just because one person says it. Because you don't know that that person is true. That's why gossip is such a dangerous thing. Because you're listening to one person tell you this. And at that point, you can either say, nope, I'm not getting involved in your gossip here. Or you join in. And their sin becomes your sin. But the Word of God says, so it is told you, verse 4, you hear of it and then you shall inquire diligently. And now it's speaking about leaders. Here, it's speaking about how, how judgment has to happen, the people that are responsible. And, it's, and if it is indeed true and certain 
that this has taken place. You shall bring this man or woman who has committed that wicked thing and shall stone to death that man or woman with stones. Okay, it's just rendering judgment. But verse 6 here is important for us to understand. Whoever is deserving of death shall be put to death on the testimony of, what does it say there? On the testimony of two or three witnesses. He shall not be put to death on the testimony of one witness. This is the command. This is the word of God. This is what Deuteronomy teaches. The judges and the priests were to search out the matter to confirm whether the witness was true or false. They don't do this. Okay, this is a this is a kangaroo court. This is a, a, a mockery of a trial. This isn't a real trial. This is not fair. It's not a fair trial. A false witness was to be stoned to death. If somebody comes and bears false witness under the old covenant, under the 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 command or the law of God that these uh, that the Sanhedrin believed that they were enforcing and were claiming that they lived by. So a false witness was to be stoned to death. Truly under the law, all the false witnesses, including the chief priests themselves, were under the penalty of death for false witness against the Christ. And I believe this is why Christ remains silent through all of this. Yes, it's prophesied, but the reason that he remains silent is because he knows that these are false witnesses. You, you're not going to be able to defend yourself against a false witness, somebody lying against you. And if the, if the court is siding with those that are lying, what does it matter for you to say something? Isaiah 53, 7 prophesied, he was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. You know, Jesus never lost self-control. God is self-control. The Spirit of God in us is how we have self-control, relying upon the Holy Spirit. He didn't lose control. You know, we might go, oh, you guys are unfair. You guys are all lying. This is a mockery of a trial. You know, God's going to have the last word. You could say, he didn't do that. He still keeps his peace. This is what the Holy Spirit has for us as well. When you're, when you're being accused falsely, it's not for you to say, but, but, this is unfair, this is unfair, and then you get in the flesh and you say all sorts of colorful things. No, Jesus didn't do that. He stayed at peace. Peace of God, and he's God. It doesn't leave him the same way with us. The Spirit of God is always with us. We really should not lose our peace. And that's why it's important to yield to him. It's important that you spend that time with him every day because you don't know what the day, what's going to come in the day. You don't know what's about to transpire. You could have all chaos about to erupt, but God will be with you. And there's that preparation of the gospel of peace. We shod our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Amen. So Jesus did not say that he would destroy the temple made with hands and rebuild it in three days. What he said is in, found in John chapter 2, 18 through 22. He says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. You see the difference there? He was speaking about his body. He didn't say that he was going to destroy the temple and with his own hand. They were liars. It was a false witness. But here's an important aspect to consider. Why did Jesus wait until the end to declare that he was the Christ, the Son of God? Why did he do that? Well, Matthew 26, 63 records, it says, But Jesus kept silent, and the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. He's putting him under, under oath. Right. He's the high priest. Understand that Jesus honors and fulfills the word of God. He doesn't break the law of God. He fulfills and he honors the law of God, even though this high priest is corrupt. And even though Jesus knows the high priest, if he doesn't repent, he's going to stand before God in judgment. He's going to stand before Jesus Christ as Lord. He understands all of this. But yet he comes as the Lord's servant. He comes as the Lamb of God. And this high priest thinks he's greater than the Christ, than the Messiah. And he says, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Luke twenty two seventy 70 says, then they all said, are you the Son of God? And so he said to them, you rightly say that I am. The high priest calls on Jesus to testify 
and to confess if he is Messiah and God under oath. And what he's doing, and, th- and this is something important for us to see, what the high priest was doing is basically he's calling Jesus to oath under the Levitical law, under Leviticus 5.1, which says, if a person sins in hearing the utterance of an oath, and is a witness, whether he has seen or known of the matter, if he does not tell it, he bears guilt. Christ, he's God's word. He knows the law. He knows the word of God. He understands all these things. Christ, keeping all the law, finally opens his mouth and he responds. This is why Jesus at the end finally opens his mouth, because he's keeping the law of God. He keeps and fulfills God's word. And Jesus said to him, it is as you said, Matthew 26, 64. It is as you said, nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter, you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. It's recorded in Mark uh, 14 as well. The same thing. Jesus does state that he is God. You know, there's some false uh, religions, uh, Islam, uh, Jehovah's Witness. They say that Jesus never said that he was God. You're reading it right here. You're reading it right here in the word of God. Jesus says he's God. If they ever tell you, no, Jesus never said he was truly God. That you, no, you don't know the Bible. You're false. When Jesus was in the trial before the Sanhedrin, they put him under oath, according to Leviticus 5. And Jesus had to respond based upon that oath, based upon what the Levitical law required. The Lord was saying this to confirm both his deity, that he is indeed the anointed one, the Messiah, the Son of God, and his sonship. God is indeed his father. He is from above. That He is the son of man. He's born of a virgin. That's why he's called the son of man. He's ha- half man, half God. He's all man, all God. He's, he's our Lord. He's our Savior. And this was also according to the vision given to Daniel in the Scripture. So when Jesus answered this way, what he was stating to them was what's recorded in the Word of God. They all knew what he was saying. They knew what his intention was. They knew what he was communicating when he said this. Daniel 7, 13 through 14, it says, I was watching in the night visions. And behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the Ancient of Days. So Christ is, approaches the Father. The, the, the Son of Man approaches the Ancient of Days. The Son approaches the Father. And they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. Praise God. And what Daniel is, it's confirmed in the New Testament in Revelation, Revelation 6, when we see the Lamb of God approach the throne, Daniel was seeing the same thing in the Old Testament that John was seeing in Revelation. And so the Sanhedrin knew immediately what he was saying. And what's interesting here is the high priest charges Christ, the anointed one, with blasphemy, yet he himself was breaking the law according to Leviticus 24, 16, which says, And whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall be put to death. All the congregation shall certainly stone him, the stranger as well as him who is born in the land. And when he blasphemes the name of the Lord, he shall be put to death. So what is that saying here, basically? That under the law that the high priests and the Sanhedrin purport to support, They should have been stoned under the very law that they're claiming condemnation upon Jesus Christ, the Messiah. This was such a false trial, such a false mockery. And so I want to want you to take this away today, church. This is what I want you to receive here today. Hebrews 12, 3 says this for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. If the Lord Jesus went through this through difficult trials or this great difficulty of a trial, when we go through it, we look to him. We hold on to him. Lord Jesus, you know what I'm going through. You probably went, are go, have gone through something worse than I'm going through, but Lord, I look to you. You judge righteously. I know that you will work this out. But, Lord, I hold my faith, my belief onto you. Because what's going to happen is trials are going to come. Trials are going to come in our lives to try and discourage you, to, to, to cause you to lose your belief, to lose your faith, 
to lose your trust in the living God. John 20, verse 31 says, but these are written. The word of God is written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. How do we get life in his name? By believing the word of God. By, by consuming the word of God, by taking it in, by, by reading it, by speaking it over our lives, especially when it's uh, addressing issues that we're going through, especially if our heart, uh, our soul, our spirit, you know, we feel failing. Lord, my, I, I'm just so hard for me to believe because of all these things. Well, realize that we're taking in other things that are contrary to the word of God. And that's why we're not having life. But as you hold on, sometimes we just need to go to the words of Jesus. We need to read what Jesus says. Sometimes we need to take in what Jesus addresses. Sometimes you need to look in what, you know, the Holy Spirit gave the apostles in the New Testament. Sometimes you need to look at what the Holy Spirit communicated in the Old Testament. We need to take it all in and and receive it and hear it because it's life for us. Not only is it wisdom for us, but it's life indeed for us, and it's important for us. As followers of Christ, the basis of our belief must be found in Christ through his word, the word of God. Life in his name is the result, and by extension, life through the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. John 8, 31 through 32 says this, and we're we're almost done here. Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, hear this, hear this, church. This is such a key for life is such a key for following the Lord it says if you abide in my word what does that mean if you live in my word God's word is alive inside of you if you're 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 chewing on it you're spending a day part of your day you're chewing on the word of God enough to where that stays with you maybe you do it in the morning and that way you're chewing on it and it stays with you or or maybe you did it at night that's the time that you have and so that way the next morning that's what you're chewing on until the, until the following night when you can read again however it works for you but where it's living in you and he says if my word if you abide in my word he says you are my disciples indeed you're my followers if if the word of god lives inside of you then you're a follower of jesus because you're looking to him. Okay, I'm taking steps, Lord. All right, I'm following you. I'm, 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 I'm hearing your word. That, that's, that's following him. That, that's really what obeying Jesus looks like. You're just following his word. You're, you're just looking to what his word says, and you're saying, okay, all right, this is how I have to live. This is how I should live. This is what you say. This is the truth. And if it's contrary to something that I thought before, then I have to say, okay, then what I thought before was false. And I realize now that that's false because it's contrary to your word. And so I must receive what your word says. Your word is the truth. And so I have to take this in. So he says, now you're my disciples indeed. And then he says, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Amen. You know, so many people use that phrase. The world uses that phrase. You shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. But that's not entirely, completely what Jesus says. He says, if my word abides in you, if if you abide in my word, if you make place for the word of God inside of you, your heart, mind, soul, and strength, he says, then you're my disciples indeed. Then you're my followers indeed. Because you're not going to take anything less than the word of God as truth from that point. Now you're a follower. Does he say anything about being perfect here? No. Does he talk about your goodness here? No. But when you follow the word of God, that's going to change you. That's going to change you. Because you're going to want to do what pleases God. As the word of God grows more and more inside of you, that's where you're going to begin to, things that you used to do that were perfectly acceptable to you, now you're going to go, I don't want to do that anymore. It doesn't taste the same. I used to enjoy that. I don't like that anymore. I used to relish those things. I I don't like that anymore because it doesn't please God. It's not because God's sitting there with his finger and going, stop that. Stop doing that. Stop doing that. No, that's not God. That's not the Lord. You're never going to find the word of God, God doing that. That's not how he talks to his people. He says, if you're his people, he calls you my child. He calls you his son, his daughter. That's how God talks to you. That's the living God. That's truly how God speaks to you. 
If you hear God in any other way, I would question who you're hearing, what spirit you're hearing. You should test that spirit, as the word of God says. But understand, it's important. This is what Jesus is saying. So, and you shall know the truth. When, you're, when the word of God is living inside of you, you're abiding in the word of God, you're following Jesus, then you're going to start to know the truth. It's going to be revealed more and more to you, the truth. And you're going to come to moments in your life, you're going to say, oh, my gosh, I didn't realize that, that I used to think that. Oh, my gosh, Lord, I didn't realize that I was just walking and living in that idea. That's false. When I was younger, I used to think that every time something bad happened to me, that was because God was penalizing me for sins that I had made. I didn't realize that that's not who God is. God forgives. If I, now, if I'm unrepentant, then God indeed is resisting me. He says he resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. So if I'm not asking God to forgive me of my sin, I'm prideful. I'm in pride. And God is resisting me because I'm a fool. But I, I, one thing, when I would fail, I would immediately ask God to forgive me. Because I know the Bible says, the Word of God tells us that God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. So according to the Word of God, according to His promise, according to the covenant made to us, the new covenant, I was forgiven. But I thought when something bad happened to me, that was God making me pay the price for my false sins. That was such a lie. But as the truth grew inside of me, I realized that was false, and it changed my heart, and it changed how I saw the Lord. And I realized it wasn't about me. It was him. He's the one that I live for. And I wasn't stuck in my thinking in my head and whatever problems happened, you know, all those issues, I I just had a, a false perspective of God until the word of God illuminated my heart and mind to the truth. And then he goes on and he says, and the truth shall make you free. That's how we're free, church. That's really how we're free is because now the word of God is alive in us. We're abiding in the word. We're living in the word. We're followers of Christ. And we now we know the truth. You, we may know inklings before, but as we grow in the truth more and more, that truth that Jesus is the truth and he's the one that makes us free. Can you say amen to that? Let's close with this. When Jesus returns... He's looking for a people of faith. He's looking for people who believe. You're going to go through trials. Yes, you are. You're going to go through storms of life. Yes, you are. Why? Because they draw us closer to the Lord. You're standing on God's word when you go through a storm. That's the one who comes out of the storm, the one that's standing on the Lord, standing on his foundation, standing on the word of God. When Jesus is our foundation, when we're standing on things that we want or things that we think should be and it's not based on the word of God, then we're just standing on sinking sand and it's going to fail. But we're going to have trials. We're going to have storms. That's going to come. But as we abide in him, he indeed abides in us. And he's looking for faith when he returns. Luke 18, 8 says, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, and here's what I want you to hear. When the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? So that's what the Lord is looking for. When he returns, he's looking for those who believe. He's saying, do you believe? Are you holding on? You're going to fall, but get back up. Get back up. Don't lay there. Get up. Life isn't over for you yet. Get back up. And as brothers and sisters in Christ, when you see your brother or sister fall, don't be a hindrance to them. But encourage them to get up. Tell them, say, this race isn't over, my brother. Get up. Come on. I'll help you. And when when it's my turn, you help me. Because that's going to happen. Don't think that's not going to happen. Have humility of heart to understand. If it were not my brother, it could be me. So I, I want to treat him the way I would want to be treated. So encourage your family. Encourage your brothers and sisters. Don't be a detraction to them. Don't be a discouragement to them. Be an encouragement. You see them stumble. You go help them. 
You don't condemn them. You say, you know what, my brother, I'm here with you. My sister, I'm here with you. I'm going to run right next to you here. And when you get your speed and you get your strength and you start running faster than me, praise God, then I'm going to be calling out to you. I'm going to be following you and you help me. Does that make sense today, what we're hearing? Let's pray. You know, let's just do this. Let's just, would you just lift your hands to the Lord in worship and let us all just say, Lord, we believe. We believe, Lord. We believe your word. We believe that you, Jesus, were sent by the Father, that you died for us, for our sins. And Lord, it's because we believed upon you that repentance came to our heart and mind and we've asked for your forgiveness and we've received your precious salvation and your love. And Lord, we are those who are waiting for your return. Lord, we're, we're occupying until you return. Yes, we are occupying and doing your business until you return. But Lord, when you return, you're going to find us as those who believe. And would you all again respond and say, Lord, we believe. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all, church. We love you. God bless you. Occupy until the Lord returns. Amen. We'll see you next week. Monday night, 6 o'clock is our foundations class. Thursday, Bye -bye.